Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet more Warhammer Lore. Today we are going to be talking about the sneakiest, the nastiest, the bestest of the bestest war bosses, if goblin kind, Warlord Scarsnake. And of course, his almost as famous pet squig, the monstrously kawaii creature known as Gobbler. Now, right off the bat, Scarsnake is rather unique as far as greenskin leaders go, as we actually have a fair bit of information about him, not second or third hand, but coming directly from the horse's mouth, or, well, in this case, the goblin's mouth. You see, dear old Scarsnake has a bit of an ego, he might be compensating for something, like for example that he is the downtrodden goblin in an army of orcs. And so when Gork and Mork granted him a playwright from the Empire, Scarsnake decided to take them up on their offer and have the playwright write the saga of Scarsnake. And it is from the pages of this magnus opus penned by Jeremiah von Bickenstad, or is it von? In German it's von, but in Reichspiel I don't know if they use von or von. Hm. I'll just change between it intermittently to confuse the fuck out of you, shall I? Sounds like a good idea. And speaking of Jeremiah von Bickenstadt, he himself is not that interesting of a persona. A son of a minor noble family, he originally dreamed to be a famous playwright. His father wanted him to be a professor, but his free-spirited mind simply could not be held within the bounds of modern academia, if only he had lived in modern-day America. He would have found a bunch of people willing to embrace his fiction as truth, but sadly, it was not to be. As such, he simply wandered the Empire for a while after being disinherited by his father, selling his various plays to minor and major warlords in return for a bed, breakfast, and occasionally a few coins. Until, of course, he wandered into the Border Princes, a remarkably hostile area at the best of times. And from there he was abducted by a large warband of night goblins. And while the rest of his adventuring companions were immediately added as extra ingredients to tonight's fungus and mushroom stew, for some mysterious reason they took a liking to Jeremiah von Bickenstad and brought him back home with them. Where it was his pleasure to be introduced to the great mighty warlord Skarsnik, who offered him the irresistible opportunity to pen the history of the greatest warlord to have ever lived. Alternatively, Skarsnake offered Jeremiah to pen another literary masterpiece, Tonight's Menu, where Jeremiah himself would have a leading role. But humble as he was, Jeremiah graciously declined the offer of the leading role in Tonight's Goulash and instead accepted the offer to become Skarsnik's personal biographer. And the great and mighty story of the warlord that would eventually come to be known as Skarsnik, warlord of Karak Eight Peaks, began as all goblin stories begin, in a deep, dank and dirty pit, where the young Skarsnik clawed his way up from the depths along with his brethren, all of them trying to kick as many of their brethren back down into the hole as humanly possible. And this was the first moment that Skarsnake showed that there was something special about him. Instead of simply cursing at his brethren and trying to kick them back in the pit, he actually helped a few up and began leading them through the cavernous labyrinths around them. As all other night goblins, they were born deep, deep underground, and they would have to navigate their way through quite a distance of rather vicious cave networks before they could get to anything that even remotely resembled safety. And there are plenty of things living in the deep, dark caverns of the world that find goblins to be a tiny bit on the tough side to chew, but otherwise nice and necessary meals. Skarsnik managed to command his little party through the tunnels, eventually making it into the domains of the Backstairs Boys. And no, that is actually their tribal name. And I would like to take this opportunity to remind you that while we cannot be entirely certain that orcs have a genitalia, they most certainly have assholes. And when you take that information into context with the tribe's name, some rather disturbing implications arise. 
Luckily for the young Skarsnik, however, the question to sodomize or not sodomize would not be answered just yet, as he and his little goblin stumbled into the midst of the backstairs boys' camp. They were immediately integrated into the tribe, which means they were immediately thrown into irons and forced to do slave labor. But hey, at least they weren't turned into food. Yet. But rather than complain about it, Skarsnik took this rather sudden and brutal introduction into authoritarian oppression as a lesson, and began practicing much the same tactics upon his former comrades. Skarsnik would take his favored friends and sneak away while all of the other goblins were forced to do manual labor. He would guide his little group of goblins down into the tunnels below, and as long as they returned with various pieces of treasure and or food, the other goblins of the backstairs boys' tribes would usually just ignore them. After all, they brought back stuff. What could possibly be wrong with that? In fact, the young Skarsnik proved to be so effective that he was swiftly promoted to the position of a runt boy, essentially a form of slave master. However, Skarsnik was not happy about this position. It granted him certain privileges and position within the tribe, but he was fairly far down on the hierarchy, far, far beneath Big Boss Tarkid Figfinger and Master Shaman Duffskull, but at the very least, he could lord his newfound authority over the other goblins. But again, Skarsnik was not entirely happy with this, and sought ways to expand his power, and he found one rather controversial fashion. There was a certain skaven that had been captured by the backstairs boys, one Skrikrit Yellowtooth, a member of Clan Moors. Skarsnik freed the Skaven and helped him out by relaying the positions of various little groupings of goblins and other backstair boys' warbands to the Skaven. This allowed Skrikrit to quickly rise in the ranks of the clan Moors, becoming a fang leader. In return, recognizing a mutually beneficial relationship, Skrikrit conducted trade with Skarsnik and, via Skarsnik, with the backstair boys. This brought the tribe considerable amount of riches. However, Skarsnik had not quite yet developed the kind of low cunning that he would later in life, and it quickly became apparent that Skarsnik was getting far more shiny things than everyone else combined. This, unsurprisingly, roused a bit of suspicion, and Skarsnik was set to be arrested and executed presumably through a stick to the rectum. But, luckily for Skarsnik, Gork and Mork were still quite fond of the runty little greenskin, and sent a raiding party of dwarves straight up the back door of the backstair boys. This rather violent interruption to his own execution ceremony gave Skarsnik the perfect opportunity to leap into an underground river, a death sentence 99.99999% of the time, however, as we have already discovered, Skarsnik is one lucky little grot, and through some god-sent miracle, he actually managed to survive the somewhat loopy journey through the underground river, getting spat out somewhere near the base of Karak eight peaks, right into the welcoming arms of a bunch of goblin wolf riders who immediately took him captive and introduced him to their population of slaves. One step forwards, two steps back. Poor, innocent, prosecuted Skarsnik was thrown into yet another cage, this time with humans, goblins, and a few dwarves as well. A rather interesting combination, and forced to do yet more manual labor. However, Skarsnik had come quite a long way from his humble origins, and had figured out ways to uh, ingratiate himself with his new uh, hosts. And again, Skarsnik was a remarkably bright little goblin, everything considered, and he quickly managed to learn Khazalid, the language of the dwarves, just by listening to them speak. Now, this is quite the achievement, a ridiculous achievement, something that would make Skarsnik one of the Gary Suest of the Gary Seuss in the Warhammer world, considering that even humans giving access to dwarven tutors, generally speaking, struggle quite a lot with the rather 
metaphorical dwarven language. So you see, the problem with Kazalid is it is very, very, very old, and has developed numerous layers of meaning over the years, which means that the context changes the meaning of a word, and is also heavily laden in metaphor and insults. Yes, that's right. Insults. Dwarves will frequently communicate with each other almost purely through insults. Indeed, the art of insulting one another has grown to the point where it can actually be used as a way to resolve legal disputes. For example, let's say that two groups of dwarven miners happen across the same seam of metal. Once this happens, they will tap the metal seam to see if anyone else is nearby. Dwarves have developed a remarkable and good touch for feeling and hearing vibration through stone, which means that a group of dwarven miners on one end of a mineral seam could potentially hear the ones on the other side simply by tapping the metal. If it would turn out that two groups of miners had happened across the same seam, they would then begin insulting one another, one's clans, one's families, one's legacies, etc. And there is a set time limit. If one clan is so insulted, so enraged, that they cannot respond within a set amount of time, then they forfeit the right to the mineral seam. However, on the other hand, should one side go just a tiny little bit overboard and give actual insult, then that will start a clan war that could last for a few dozen generations. And considering how long dwarves live... <laughs> yes. Yeah, you can imagine. But that is, of course, all besides the point. What actually happened was that Skarsnik somehow pulled the dwarven lexicon out of his goddamn ass and learned one of the most complex languages in Warhammer over the span of, like, a year in captivity, only listening to a couple people speak. Fucking slow clap, my dude. And he then used this information to start a brawl, by suggesting that one of the dwarves' mother was engaged in an illicit sexual relationship with a pony. Proving that even in the Warhammer universe, bronies are viewed with a mixture of disgust, disbelief, and curiosity. And clearly the accusation had some merit, because the dwarf was very, very angry indeed. The fact that Skarsnik wasn't immediately throttled to death also shows that he had learned quite a few lessons on fighting during his, uh, so far rather brief but eventful lifetime. The resulting scuffle proved to be incredibly amusing for the onlooking wolf riders who decided to reward Skarsnik by setting him free and putting him to work outside of the cages at least. Additionally, the great goblin war boss leading the wolf riders was very, very impressed by the fact that Skarsnik had somehow managed to learn Kazalid under such strenuous circumstances, not to mention so goddamn quickly. And after Skarsnik had once again proved his worth to yet another tribe of goblins, he was given a leadership position, which he quickly began abusing for his own benefit, because, well, goblin, obviously. Now, of course, Skarsnik is a night goblin. That means that he is not particularly fond of the great outdoors and sunshine in general. Considering the fact that he'd been dragged around in a cage for something along the lines of a year, he'd probably grown somewhat accustomed to it, but... Night goblins are just not very glad of open spaces. In fact, you could say that they all suffer from collective agoraphobia. Additionally, their eyes have developed to work in extremely low light conditions, and now that Skarsnake was constantly exposed to the merciless rays of a giant ball of fire, his eyes were hurting, just some teensy weensy little bits. As such, he really wanted to return back to the mountain, however, his new boss was not particularly fond of this idea, and wanted Skarsnik to take lead of the goblin wolf riders. Originally, Skarsnik tried to convince Griff Makiki, the leader of the wolf riders, to simply just let him return to the mountains and potentially join him in his adventures below ground, but unsurprisingly, goblin wolf riders are no more fond of the deep, dark undergrounds than Skarsnik was of the wide open spaces above ground. As such, Skarsnik found himself forced to do the only thing that was right in the circumstances. Namely, viciously murdering Griff Makiki and stealing his tribe from beneath him. 
It was practically self-defense, wasn't it? I mean, Griff didn't want to do what Scarsnake wanted to do, so the only solution was violence. <laughs> Obviously. And so, after righteously self-defending his previous boss to death, Skarsnik took his wolf riders and began the long journey home. On one of the many cold and desolate nights on his way back home, he drank a lot. And then God came to speak to him. Because of course. And Gork had a message for Skarsnik, one only he could understand. Get the fuck home! So deep. And so Skarsnik decided to go home. Granted, he'd always been going home, but... Details. It's now a mission from God, rather than just simply his own self-entitlement. Huh. Convenient. Anyways, when he arrived back at Karak 8 Peaks, he found the gates to be closed. You might think that this is rather obvious, it being a dwarf hold, but at this point in time, the poor bearded little bastards had been kicked out of Karak 8 Peaks for a very, very long time. The upper levels had, generally speaking, been controlled by various groups of orcs and greenskins, while the lower levels were usually held by the Skaven, with a few exceptions. The Backstairs Boys being one of those exceptions. And it didn't take long for Skarsnik's superior brain power to figure out that the Skaven must have taken over control of the upper reaches of the Karak. He deduced it after one of his scouts had received a Warpstone bullet through the skull. It might not be deductive powers exactly on par with the ever-famous Sherlock Holmes, but then again, he's a fucking goblin. What do you expect of the poor lad? Jesus. To circumnavigate this new impediment, he decided to head back down underneath the mountain. Luckily for Skarsnik, he had spent most of his formative years rumbling around in those very tunnels, and he could relatively easily find his way back to the old territory of the Backstairs Boys. He essentially slipped in through their back door. Patumtish. Moving swiftly on, where he discovered that his old tribe was still in command of these territories. However, there was one small problem. Apparently, one of Skarsnik's old friend, friend as in someone who had previously tried to put a dirk into Skarsnik's back, was now in control of the Backstairs Boys. And so, when Skarsnik made his presence known, he was immediately thrown into a fighting pit and made to amuse the local population of Cave Squigs. Now, as far as goblins go, Skarsnik was a pretty damn decent fighter, and considering he had lived most of his early years in these very caves, he had plenty of experience dealing with squigs. Indeed, he had even, in a moment of rare kind-heartedness, saved one of these lovable little creatures from the very same rival who had just thrown him into a pit with all of his extended family members. But it would appear that the gig was up. In front of poor little Skarsnik, whose life, brief and unfair though it might have been, was flashing before his eyes, stood the biggest squig he had ever seen. The size of a medium orc. This disgustingly large and exceedingly toothy creature, the size of a tractor tire, was towering over poor little Skarsnik, and preparing to devour him in but an instant like a fancy hors d'oeuvre at a dinner party. But once again, fate intervened on Skarsnik's behalf, and instead of simply just chowing down on the poor defenseless little goblin, the massive fat-ass squig began loudly sniffing Skarsnik. After a few moments of mild confusion and disbelief and or pants-wetting fear, the budding goblin warboss realized that the monstrosity standing in front of him was not about to eat him. In fact, it looked almost cuddly in that I will violently and viciously devour your enemies kind of way, and Skarsnik realized that this was the very same rubbery monstrosity that he had saved in the caves oh so long ago. Convenient. And with the equally convenient intervention of his loyal goblin wolf riders, who had figured that Boss really should be back by now and headed down into the tunnels after him, God only knows how the fuck they found their way in the tunnels they'd never been in, but hey, minor bloody details. The Backstairs Boys was once again ambushed through the back door. 
You'd really think they'd put a fucking guard on that entrance at this point, but hey, as I mentioned near the beginning of this video, to sodomize or not to sodomize is ever the question in Goblin Society, and the Baxter boys had clearly chosen the latter option, and therefore they were swiftly wiped out, and the few remaining goblins quickly surrendered to Skarsnik's authority. To be fair, Skarsnik had gained himself quite the following at this point. Not only had he incorporated the Backstairs boys into his budding horde, he had also integrated the various orc tribes that he had ran into on his way back to Karak Eight Peaks. All in all, Skarsnik now found himself in control of a fairly sizable population of goblins, a few orcs, and even a handful of magic users. Oh, and least we forget, of course, the 375 pound cave squig monstrosity that had just finished eating Skarsnik's last rival in the Backstairs Boys. And I'm really, really glad that I'm no longer going to have to say Backstairs Boys, because every time I say that, I get a mental image of the old boy band Backstreet Boys getting a ramrodded in an alley somewhere. It's not a pretty picture. Anyways, now that Skarsnik had regained control over his old territories and increased his warband, he was about to try and get himself a more solid picture of the situation, and it was a grim one indeed. Apparently, the Skaven had actually managed to unify themselves for once, a rarity to put it rather bluntly, and had launched a massive offensive against the various greenskin tribes holding the upper reaches of Karak 8 Peaks. The Rat Folk had launched a huge invasion deep into Goblin territory, splitting the largest tribes in two, scattering the hordes of goblins into the west and the easternmost reaches of Karak 8 Peaks, while the Skaven controlled all of the central tunnels, meaning that they could ferry warbands as needed up and down the various tunnels, while the goblins would have to move all of their warbands up through the winding tunnels they themselves have created in the bedrock of the mountain considerably slower than using the old dwarf infrastructure. This gave the Skaven an absolutely massive advantage, as they could simply just concentrate all of their forces on one tiny portion of the goblins at once and began to slowly but surely eradicate them. Thusly, it became very, very clear to Skarsnik that he could not make it apparent that he was gathering up forces to try and launch an attack against the Skaven. If the Skaven got even the slightest whiff of the fact that some kind of leader figure was rising amongst the goblins, they would undoubtedly gather all of their forces and crush that tiny little threat to their dominance before it could bloom into full-scale warfare. The simple fact that Skarsnik recognized this fact is incredible enough in and of itself, but what came next was considerably more impressive. Skarsnik not only understood that he could not let it be known that he was gathering the various tribes, he also understood that the Skaven had to be convinced that the goblins were even weaker than they thought them to be, and even weaker than they really were. Essentially, Skarsnik wanted to create a situation in which the Skaven were completely convinced that the goblin forces in the west, under the command of Skarsnik, were absolutely no threat whatsoever to the great Skaven invasion, just a bunch of scattered small tribes too busy bashing each other's skulls in to pose any real danger. This meant that the Skaven would focus all of their efforts on the remaining Night Goblin tribes in the east, that were still under the command of the Crooked Moons and their chieftain. Therefore, Skarsnake ordered his various subordinates to launch dozens of tiny little raids on the Skaven. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, how is that going to convince him that the goblins were no threat? Well, every single raid would be led by a different tribe, and every single raid would end in a staged rout where the little goblins would scurry away into the darkness, seemingly repulsed by the oh-so-mighty brave Skaven warriors. This would create the impression that the various tribes in the west were all fighting against each other, and the losers were being driven towards the Skaven in a haphazard disorganized band that the Skaven could easily drive off. 
And partially, that was actually the case, because whilst the main leadership of uh, the Karak Eight Peak Goblins was isolated in the east, most of the remaining chiefs and shamans would fairly easily submit to Skarsnik and his considerably larger horde, but there were still plenty of goblin warlords and magic casters that decided they were the chosen of Gork and Mork, and not some upstart bastard from the lower levels. As such, Skarsnik would simply have to self-defense them into submission. Or occasionally. You know when I mentioned those feigned retreats? That seems like a really complicated strategy for goblins to enact, doesn't it? And yes, yes it is. Which is why Skarsnik got rid of some of his more vocal uh, opposition by simply telling them to charge the Skaven and going, I'll come support you soon, wink wink. And voila, one less political enemy. It might not be feigned, but it is a route, so it achieves much the same goal. In fact, the real route is even better, because it usually involved bad goblins rather than the good, loyal types of goblins. And thusly, after enough uh, feigned routes and other such things had happened, only the good, loyal, gentle goblins and orcs remained, and all of the evil upstart goblins and orcs had been sent to Gork and Mork, where they will be receiving their just punishment for not believing enough in Skarsnik. With the first phase of the plan out of the way, now we initiated the second phase of the plan, the destruction of the Skaven leadership, and once again, for god only knows which time, the gods smile upon dear little Skarsnik. You remember that Skaven that he had some dealing with back when he was part of the... I'm not gonna say a tribe? Squeakrit Yellowtooth. It turns out that while Skarsnik had benefited quite a bit from their trade, Yellowtooth had as well, and had risen to the position of High Chieftain of Clan Moors, a rather considerable position. He was at this point one of the two main leaders of the Skaven forces that had invaded the upper reaches of Karak Eight Peaks, and he too remembered his old trusted friend Skarsnik, from which he had benefited oh so very, very much. Skarsnik pretended that he wanted to restart their business dealing with one another, and offered him no doubt a great deal of lovely things. Yellowtooth on his side was asked to bring all of the Skaven leadership, so that they could discuss a full and proper treaty, and with the aid of Skarsnik and his goblins, the remaining goblin forces in this part of Karate Peaks would almost certainly be done for. It was a pretty good deal, and Skrikrit of course brought with him not only the leadership, but most of their troops as well, just in case his old friend decided to betray him. Now again, remember, the last time Skrikrit had seen Skarsnik, he was a minor leader at best. He was a slave master with perhaps a few dozen goblins under his command. The force that Skarsnik could muster these days was considerably larger, which which took poor little Skrikrit entirely by surprise as he was betrayed. You'd honestly think a Skaven would know better, but apparently not. And so in one swift and vicious strike, much of the Skaven leadership was annihilated. This allowed the Greenskins to continue their march on one of the two primary Skaven camps. This too, however, was but a ruse. When the Skaven detected the first horde of orcs and goblins, they began withdrawing to the other side of the chamber. This would allow them to regroup, rearm themselves, equip themselves, and generally speaking, just get ready for a fight. They were caught quite by surprise, seeing as they thought that the goblins on this particular play were more or less dealt with already, but nevertheless, it was a relatively small goblin army, and there was a lot of Skaven. What the poor little ratty watties didn't know, however, was that Skarsnik was quite familiar with this particular part of Karak Eight Peaks. He knew that the walls around here were relatively thin, and so with stashes of dwarven gunpowder that he had managed to steal and away from the Skaven, he planted them in strategic locations against the very wall that the Skaven were now retreating towards. 
he communicated with the rest of his army via drummers, a rather ingenious ploy for a goblin. He set up essentially a relay system, where various sets of drummers would be in earshot of each other and would therefore be able to pass on instructions and pre-arranged signals. Once the main goblin force had arrayed themselves for battle and the Skaven had been pushed up against the walls, a signal was sent noting that they were ready to attack. Once the signal was received, Skarsnik detonated the blasting charges, opening several holes in the wall directly behind the Skaven. Now the poor little ratties were caught between two advancing tides of greenskins, and rather quickly surrounded. Rather uncharacteristically, however, the Skaven fought back rather ferociously. They figured they could still be saved, and a Skaven that is fighting to live is one fuck of a ferocious little bastard. As I mentioned, there were two main camps, and the denizens of the second camp were now marching into this great vaulted chamber to reinforce their fellows. This was the lifeline that the Skaven clung to oh so desperately, but it was a lifeline that Skarsnik was just about to cut. Once the second horde had made contact with this huge underground chamber now being filled by thousands, if not tens of thousands of goblins and skavens all brutally fighting each other, Skarsnik initiated the last phase of his plan. This was close to the upper levels of Karak Eight Peaks, and an infiltration squad had been sent to the gate. The infiltration squad succeeded in opening the main gates of the Karak, allowing Skarsnik's wolf riders to flood into the Karak itself. And this completed the mass encirclement of both Skaven armies. They were now trapped in two separate pockets, with the first army on one side, Skarsnik and his elites in the middle, and now hordes of wolf riders pouring into their rear. And while Skaven will fight very, very ferociously indeed, if they think there is a possibility that they might win, they will run twice as quickly if they think that there is a possibility they might not. The ensuing rout was swift, sudden, and utterly complete, with every single little ratman on the battlefield suddenly remembering some important arrangement that he simply could not miss, and they all began scurrying for any opening they could throw themselves at. A considerable number of the fluffy little bastards managed to escape because, well, Skaven. They're pretty damn good at running away. But, as far as Skaven power in the upper levels were concerned, the Skaven army was completely and utterly shattered. Because, after all, once a Skaven decides to run, he fully and completely commits to that task and does not stop running unless there is someone with a very, very big stick standing in his way. And with this great victory, Skarsnik was finally given the name of Skarsnik. He was lauded as a hero of goblin kin and the savior of all the goblins and greenskins within Karak Eight Peaks. Up until this point, he has simply been known as Runtget. Goblin naming sense, what can I say? Anyways, with his new name, Skarsnik was now the de facto leader of all the Greenskins within Karak Eight Peaks, and with the main Skaven armies that was leading the thrust destroyed, this allowed him to reunite with the rest of the goblins in the east, and launch a huge simultaneous attack rolling downwards throughout the levels of Karak Eight Peaks and throwing what remained of the Skaven back into the lower depths of the Karak, re-establishing a balance of power that has held solid for a very, very long time now. The only minor change is that dwarves have arrived back in Karak 8 Peak. There is a small enclave of dwarves in the upper reaches that manage to bash their way in and construct a heavily fortified camp in the upper reaches. Skarsnik has so far decided to let them stay there. He probably could wipe them out, but he fears that any overt move against the dwarves would require a lot of his forces. This would in all due likelihood be an open invitation to the Skaven to come and sneak up his back stairs. Wink wink. And to be entirely honest, the handful of bearded savages currently squatting in the upper reaches 
don't really constitute much in the way of a threat. They would only constitute any kind of real threat if they were reinforced in significant numbers, and so far Skarsnik has been able to prevent that from happening. Any dwarf expedition that is launched to rejoin with the forces at Karakate Peaks will have to run a gauntlet of goblin ambushes and large-scale escalade attacks upon their convoys. Skarsnik has so far defeated not one but two major reinforcement attempts by dwarves in the rest of the Dwarven Empire, something that his trophy rack filled with nice little Dwarven beards can attest to. And since it does not appear to be at all likely that Skarsnik will be overthrown from within at pretty much any point in time, Skarsnik is practically a living legend amongst goblin kind at this point, it would require some mighty orc warboss to oust him, and even then, Skarsnik has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. You might think that a mere goblin would be easily outed in a greenskinned tribe that values might over anything, and it is after all a society where might quite literally makes right, but Skarsnik has a rather healthy habit of poisoning, betraying, backstabbing, or in some other way getting rid of any orcs within the tribe that seems to be growing a little bit too big for their pants. And so, unless some credible outside threat emerges, Skarsnik and Gobbler will in all due likelihood live happily ever after in the mountain of Karak Eight Peaks. Oh, and before I forget, fuck the end time, so don't even suggest it. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.